Welcome to the sixth in our series of lunchtime seminars presented by the Aoki Center at UC Davis Law School, uh, focusing on tribal justice. Uh, the goal of the program is to create a network of practitioners, uh, judges, lawyers, social workers, clerks, anybody who's concerned with justice in Indian country. And one of our goals is to learn from each other and to build that community. So to that end, I invite you to turn on your cameras so that you can see each other. Uh, unfortunately, we can't gather in the same room, but we can see each other and begin that process of knowing who else is there. Uh, last week, for example, I reconnected. I saw the name of the judge who gave me my first start as a judge. Uh, so it was a good chance for me to reconnect. Uh, hopefully when you're on, uh, there will be people who see you, who recognize you, and we can again start to rebuild and strengthen that community. Uh, UC Davis uh, wants to acknowledge that they sit upon the land of the Wintu Nation and view themselves as trustees of that land uh, and want to honor the people who came before them. We have, through the work of Chad Smith, who is the principal director of this program, uh, an opportunity to give away a Pendleton throw uh, each week. Uh, this week, the winner of that Pendleton throw is, or from last week that we announced this week, is April Carmelo from Greenville Rancheria. So April, somebody from the program should be reaching out to you in the next couple of days. Uh, I want to acknowledge again, Chad Smith, who is the director of this program, was the formal principal chief at Cherokee, as well as John Miller, an attorney and our tech guru, who literally keeps everything together. I, without them, this series would not have happened or have been nearly as successful as we have been able to make that. We are especially lucky to have the speaker today. Uh, April Smith will be joining us and, excuse me, Angel Smith. And I happen to be a member of her fan club. I have listened to her speak and I look forward to that at every opportunity. She has a unique perspective that I think is so important in that she, in addition to being a practitioner, has been the subject of equal litigation as she grew up. So she has seen this literally from both sides. Uh, and I urge you to take advantage, to ask questions, to listen with an open heart and mind, because this is a special opportunity uh, that uh, does not come along very often. So April, I'm gonna turn this over to you. If, uh, if you start your video, you're free to take off. Great, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm Angel Smith and I am Cherokee, not related to our wonderful Chad Smith, but um, I am absolutely, um, entrenched within our community um, in Oklahoma. I, I think I'm gonna show you a couple things. I'm gonna try screen share. Um, just to give you a concept of, and bear with me here, um, I have a couple things. A concept of how long I have been an ICWA expert. I hope you can see that. Um, that is myself and my grandfather. Um, I was, I went into custody, at about 14 months old, I was abandoned uh, by my birth parents at a women's shelter in Tulsa County, was the youngest of four children. So, you know, I'm going to try to keep this short because I could spend hours telling you my life story and the complicated nature that got me here. But I went into custody at about, I said, about a year and a half old uh, after being abandoned in a women's shelter. I was there for about 30 days at about I would say 14 to 16 months, somewhere in there, I was placed by a private agency with a non-Native family. Um, 
and they were a great foster family. I'm still very, very much um, connected with them. I think they're wonderful people. Um, but they had me approximately two to three years. My case started about 1980, 81. Um, I was born 1978 uh, when the law was actually enacted. And um, at about, I would say two years in, my birth parent was not doing visitation, didn't know who that, you know, woman was at that time. To me, it was just some stranger who would come and go. I did know my grandparents, as you can see my grandfather there, um, and my grandmother. I knew my half sibling that they were raising who was older. Um, they did visitation with the foster family. You know, things were just kind of rocking along. Um, at the point it reached termination, suddenly it was discovered I was an Indian child. I was an Indian child the entire time. My birth certificate showed that. It was just something that was either not caught and or kind of overlooked at that time. Again, it was early years of ICWA as a federal law. Um, my older two siblings, as I said, there were four of us. The oldest one was with my grandparents. There's two in between us. They were placed um, in a non-ICWA compliant placement and adopted out. Um, gosh, I think I'm going to try to show this from here. I don't know if you can see that. That is the only picture of the four of us together. I am the infant. <laughs> okay, so that's how young we all were when this, this really started. Um, they, were, they were adopted out. I was about two, I believe, at that time when they were officially adopted. So at the point it was determined, I was a Iqua Indian child. Um, I became one of the early litigations in Oklahoma. It, my case went up to our state Supreme Court um, in an unpublished opinion called In Re AO. Um, at that time, I would say I was probably about five. My case lasted on paper until 1988. So I spent time bouncing, and this was, you know, again, early days of ICWA, the litigation going up and down were what was an expert witness? Um, you know, is this a, is, this child necessarily an Indian child. I mean, it was back and forth, back and forth. Issues that we still see in litigation today, but it, it lingered from 1981 to, like I said, about 1988 on paper. Um, in the interim of that, um, I was doing two weeks with my foster family, two weeks with my birth parent. I was placed back with my birth mother. I was the only child that she ever regained custody of. And unfortunately, that was not a very, um, prosperous placement, I would say. Um, it was kind of recognized even by my attorney at the time as potentially not going to be successful, but the law was complied with. I was there about a year and my birth parent then took me, um, her parents had moved out of state probably after years of, you know, intense litigation and, and trying to start over. So she took me out of state to where they were. Um, didn't come back and pick me up. And I stayed there approximately a year. Then I went back to my birth parent who had moved from an Oklahoma to another state. Um, I was there about a year. Then um, she was, she had married in the interim and, you know, we bounced through a few more states. And by the age of 13, I was back in Oklahoma. Um, and again, it was not a very successful placement. It, there was every statistic that exists for, for native kids or really any children coming out of custody into an issue or into a home where there's, you know, drugs and alcohol and, um, instability. I did have my grandparents though. And that's the part that, um, you know, I want to be very, very, very firm in that my grandparents were from the time I can remember the most important and influential relationship that I had. Um, in fact, when I went into foster care, when they picked me up from the, the uh, foster care shelter, um, they took me home and set me down and I went running around the room again at about, you know, 15 months old yelling brown papa, brown papa. So they knew that somebody in my life obviously you can see, was very important to me. Um, that relationship maintained through all of the, the chaos that was going on with my birth parents, um, that relationship was intense. At 14, I had been taken to visit my grandparents for my birthday and I was about to turn 15 and I refused to go back. So at that point, I basically looked at my grandfather and I said, you know, either I'm gonna stay here or I'm going to... Um, 
find a job and, you know, leave school. I, you know, again, 14, 15, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but I wasn't going to go back to the chaos. My grandpa said, well, I guess you're staying here. Um, so I stayed with them for almost two years without technically anyone having legal custody other than my birth parent, who again, I refused to go to. Um, at 16, my grandparents were very, very poor. I mean, we lived on a family of four at that time, four to $500 a month. We were, we were very poor. They were both, gosh, my grandmother was in her late seventies. My grandpa in his, his early seventies. So they took in the six, you know, 15, 16 year old kid. Um, they had no legal custody. <laughs> they, they put me in school. I was struggling because I had unfortunately been, you know, a victim of molestation and, and I was in the middle of all of that chaos and, but I was a good kid and I was a smart kid. So, you know, we were, we were going through that journey together. Um, but what I had known from my early equal case, and I'm going to jump back is at five years old, Tulsa County courthouse, orange chairs. I'm sitting there with my, um, attorney at the time. And we were talking about, you know, my case and, and who I was and what an Indian child was. And I knew at five or six, I would be an attorney for Indian kids. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't really understand it, but I knew I would do that. And so um, very young, I, I started becoming an expert in ICWA by life experience. So at 16, I did have a second ICWA case out of the state of Oklahoma, but it was a kinship foster placement with my grandparents. My former foster family, because my grandparents were very poor, actually paid the legal fees. So what I did have through the course of, of my incredibly complicated ICWA life story from one to 18 was a support system, which not all of our children necessarily um, are lucky enough to have that. I had a very close relationship with my grandfather, as I've indicated. Um, here's a picture of us when I was very, very, very young, just so you can see. And the importance of being Cherokee to me has influenced pretty much my entire life. Um, what it means to be native, what it means to be part of a native community. And, you know, Yes, I'm a citizen, but I am also culturally bound. Um, my, my grandmother, um, which I actually have a picture of Chad with her that I, I can't find, but um, he actually met my uh, technically great grandmother, but my grandmother. Um, and, you know, she was a full blood Dazalati out of Saline district, which is prior Oklahoma at this, this time. But her family traces to the Trail of Tears. We were the Hildebrandt removal group, um, Young Bird, and then we have, you know, lines coming out of Tahlequah District. So, I mean, I'm very entrenched, entrenched in um, a tribal family. The challenge for that um, came as I grew older. Um, I knew I was going to go to law school. Obviously, I knew I was going to be an attorney. Um, I didn't know everything that that meant. I, I went to a school that was near where I lived at the time. They didn't have an Indian law program, which is wonderful that this school does um, have such great leaders within Indian country working with you guys. Um, for me, I did independent studies. I became an intern at Cherokee Nation uh, for free. Um, I worked nights at a domestic violence shelter to pay for my gas back and forth, <laughs> which you're not supposed to do in law school, but um, at that, that first year. But you know, I worked really hard and eventually ended up um, becoming an assistant attorney general at Cherokee Nation. And my very first case, I, I had a docket, you know, just a docket. Um, I think at that point it was child support. But my very first equal case. Oh my goodness. Um, I ended up in Kansas in front of the Kansas Supreme Court. And again, I was a baby lawyer. I didn't really know what I was doing. Didn't get every filing correct, but we struck down baby boy L, um, which that case is what established the existing Indian family doctrine originally in Kansas. So, you know, coming out of law school. I, I, I think Angel is being very modest. Uh, that case <laughs> that she's talking about uh, the Kansas Supreme Courts basically slapped themselves on the forehead and said, duh, what were we thinking right. uh, when we established that exception? So it wasn't just that she won, but she got the Kansas Supreme Court to say, this was one of the biggest mistakes we had ever made and we wanna correct that. So if for nothing else, Angel's legal career has already paid huge dividends. I would say that it was overwhelming at the time when you're looking at that panel of nine, you know, judges. And I, I had a, another attorney that was a friend with me there. Um, and, you know, I remember being interrupted and they said, 
but why does ICWA matter? Why does ICWA matter? And so at that point, I just said, because if we lose a child, we lose the future. We lose the voice of, if we lose that child now, we lose our tribe in the future, something along that line. And they quoted that. And that was not legal. That was angel talking because I understood ICWA from the position of having been in that, um, you know, child role as an ICWA kid. So uh, long story short, I, I did stay with my tribe for a while. I, I eventually left, um, I went private. Um, you know, that has been a challenge. I did do some work with Creeks, Creek Nation. Um, I've sat on a couple, you know, courts, which many of us do. Uh, we kind of process through, you know, different roles in Indian country. But the challenge um, for me, and this is where, again, I'm kind of keeping this more personal because I want to make it will make sense from my perspective before I jump into a few um, takeaway points for for everyone is that, you know, I had my first child, he was four months old. I have adopted a couple kids that were ICO kids, um, but I had a four month old baby and I was on hiatus from private practice and baby girl B, which is the last federal ICO case, the ruling was issued. And I handed my son to my husband and I said, <laughs> okay, hold him, I'll be right back. And I was requested at that point um, by my tribe to represent baby girl B or baby Veronica. I just call her Veronica. And um, that was a challenge. And you know, it's you can talk about all the legals. We can we can talk about what the Supreme Court did. I'm going to trust that you guys are um, well versed in your ability to look up these cases. But in that case, the United States Supreme Court they did not recognize ICWA as applicable. But what they did not do, which is discussed in, um, you know, some of the dissent, is uh, is recognize the child's interest, which is one of my ongoing things. You have to recognize that that even how do I say that? ICWA itself has you know three interests, and and it's I'm kind of jumping a little bit, so I'll try to refocus. But you have the tribe, you have the the parents or the Indian custodian, and you have the child. And what I did not see is the court saying, okay, here's the Indian child interest. And that is where I'm gonna hop into a PowerPoint, bear with me, um, that I think we have to think about ICWA itself and why why it matters and, and understands its frame. Um, it was adopted in 78. There, I absolutely encourage people um, to read the legislative history. I'm not gonna go through those tens of thousands of pages, but there is a lot there on why it was adopted, which was our children were being removed, which is ultimately attack on sovereignty, right? We don't have our children, we don't have a future as a tribe. But um, it also recognizes that our children, and I'm really focusing on the child role, our children themselves have a right to our tribe. We have a right to our community. We have a right to our family. We have a right to our land and our language and our religion and our, you know, our social and cultural norms. We have a protected right there. Um, and that is something that ICWA was not discussed, you know, with baby girl B. It's something that really probably wasn't raised early enough. Um, it is something I, I was raising the four months that I, I was representing her. And I have never lost a case on, on those arguments for the child, for a tribe trying to get their child, um, but recognizing that the child interest is part of the federal law and why it matters. So today I'm really focusing on kind of that level of discussion and bear with me here. <clears throat> why our tribes have to get involved a little bit more or why we as tribal community people have to understand ICWA. It's not just a federal law. It's not just something that states kind of need to know about. It's not, it's not something that tribes kind of need to jump in and out of. We need to understand that it is protecting our children that are in foster care or adoptive situations and it is a way to bring them home. So, um, and, Again, this is a very broad discussion. I'm trying to keep very narrow, but what ICWA is not is something, it's not giving our children their rights. These are rights that we have always had. We've always been recognized within our tribal communities as having. ICWA was just the federal government's attempt to establish a law that protected our children because at the time it was adopted, astronomical numbers of our children were being removed and placed through things like the Indian Adoption Project, through, you know, we had boarding schools, 
beyond before and beyond even up until you know the 70s so it it really was about giving us some framework in which tribes can initiate or families or children bringing our kids home and keeping them within community um it really is about protecting our children and it's about recognizing and this is the part where i come in and i really get passionate is it's about recognizing that we're not just looking at substantive and procedural you know requirements that are out there they're out there they're within the law but we have a venue to bring in our own social and cultural norms for each tribe and defend those on behalf of our children whether that is me as an attorney for an indian child whether that's a tribal attorney um you know we have those uh, those chances to come in and bring our own tribal laws, customs, practices within provision of the act and make it an actual legal argument. And that's something um, from the Indian child side that I have really tried to advocate um, in the last, particularly five years, um, really focused on trying to get people to not just think about ICWA as the litigation that the tribes are doing, or sometimes a parent will bring it up, but that we are actually protecting the rights of our children in our communities, within our tribes, within the services. And I think um, Chad has, has brought this up even um, in a prior few minutes there before, is that when we're bringing our kids home or we're, we're offering our, our tribal involvement, we're not just offering, hey, this kid can be in our foster care program. We are offering education. We are offering you know, housing. We are offering counseling services. We are offering you know, whatever breath that our tribes have um, within services, those are available to our children. So that is why the ability to be involved in these cases is critical um, early. And that can be very, very hard for tribes sometimes to understand that we can't always just monitor. And again, we have so many children in custody across the country. I understand the numbers can be astronomical, but we sometimes just can't monitor. We have to engage um, or we have to find ways to make sure our children are being protected even if we can't always go to court. So um, I'm gonna, hop a slide here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Doesn't like me. Um, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Angel. It looks like your slides are stuck on that first one with you and your grandfather. Oh, you can't see that. Okay, let me. So you may may want to exit and then reshare again. Let's see, is that, is that, can you guys see that? No? No, we can't. Good. Let me bear with me. Okay. Let me try one more time. No. One. Yep, it's up. Okay, you can see it. Yes. That's funny because all I can see is my the one of my grandfather now. So <laughs> one more time. But you guys can actually see the PowerPoint. We can, if you want to put it in the present. Yep, good. Okay. Um, okay, so um, Indian child interest under ICWA, just to kind of summarize, any party can raise, um, and I know I'm jumping a little bit into the law, any party can raise the other party's interest. So um, I really, really wish that sometimes our tribes, and I'm speaking more from a government perspective, would raise our child's interest early. And, and even though those interests can be competing, the tribe can still raise them. And if the tribe can't, then um, the federal law does allow our children to have attorneys appointed, which again, in state courts is very common, but here's my big question is, do the attorneys understand the rights of the Indian child? Um, one of those early issues that came out of Baby Girl B when it was still in South Carolina was the child attorney there said, well, I didn't really consider that child being native. Well, if you're not doing that and it's an Indian child, then I don't think you're adequately representing, representing our children. Um, you're certainly not recognizing their rights and their protections, which, you know, perhaps that itself could be misconduct. But um, understanding that the child themselves can actually seek to have a proceeding invalidated if the law has not been followed. Um, a tribe can raise that, of course, itself on its own interest, or a parent can raise it, but a child can raise it. And so 
there have been times when I've seen tribes raise those claims when the child's attorney is not in agreement, but the tribe is like, yeah, but you're violating the rights of the child. Um, the BIA guidelines that came out in 2016 do recognize that our Indian child's best interest, because I get a lot of questions about best interest of the child, our Indian children's best interest is the application of the federal law. Um, I think I've kind of said this a few times, but our children's interest being raised early. Um, and again, I think that's something that even in baby girl B, I would have liked to have seen done at a, at a lower court level. Um, and always asking the question if the attorney or the GAL representing the child is adequately versed in the ability to recognize or understand the child's interest um, as an Indian child within these cases. Are there any questions on that? People are free to interrupt. No. Okay. Um, Again, I've said this a few times, but ICWA is not about giving our children rights, nor is any, any law that really applies to our children. These are things that we have always held. It's something I held when I, I was born, you know, just by nature of that, being the sixth, seventh generation of my family post-removal. March 23rd is the anniversary date that my family stepped into Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. Those are, those are part of my stories and part of my family's stories, part of my son's stories, and those are important and they belong to me as a community member. That's not something that the, the law is giving to me. And, and one of the important things, and this is where I'm going to talk just a little bit more, and I'm hoping I'm not overstepping my time here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about social and cultural norms is what our tribes do within our, our own governmental approaches helps us raise these claims, helps someone like me that's a frontline attorney raise our children's claims. Um, ICWA is not applicable in tribal court. However, what our tribes do, our own statues, what our government's public acts are, I can raise any of those. So there are some things that I would love to see tribes um, begin to do, and some are, particularly domesticating certain um, international documents or parts of those documents, you know, those back to the tribe and saying, hey, we recognize that this is what our children have already had, but these are some frames which in, we're gonna pull in. Um, but, Creek Nation the non, themselves has developed. I'm sorry. For the non-lawyers, yeah. when it, Angel's referring to domesticating, she means basically taking international treaties, international statements, making them a part of tribal law, and then she can use those in court when she's arguing cases, uh, because then it becomes part of tribal law. It's not just an outsider's opinion on something. And the beautiful part is it's not just even necessarily a legislative act. It can be what is community, you know, based principles um, that are led by the traditional leaders of that tribe or traditional community leaders. Any of that information that is encompassed, it, we can utilize that on the ground in equal litigation. And so that is one of those things that if I'm working with the tribe, the tribe behind me was Nez Pierce, that's where that blanket came from. If I'm working with the tribe, I'm gonna try to do everything I can to understand, even though I'm not of that tribe perhaps, what their social and cultural norms are. If that means I'm meeting with their elders, if that means I'm reviewing documents from 25 years ago, I'm gonna do that because I can take that and pull that in and establish it as a framework of what is in the best interest of this Indian child. Again, I know that that is somewhat abstract, but the federal law is there to utilize and that's how we keep our kids home. And so unfortunately the litigations continue. Um, you know, we still have the fifth circuit going on. I'm not involved in that case, but I'm obviously watching it like everybody. Um, there are issues always being raised right now, particularly by the same groups that were kind of behind some things going on with baby girl B, uh, questions of equal protection, not failing to recognize that this is about citizenship. Uh, you know, the federal government even, I would say, um, not the federal government, but the Supreme Court in the baby girl B case talked about how much Indian or how much Cherokee is this, this little girl. And I, I come back to that to say, you know, you want to talk about full circle. Um, the person that was over the private agency that um, had me when I was little um, was the person who worked for the state and signed off on the, that child leaving the state of Oklahoma in the first place. And you know, we're talking about how much Cherokee is a child. The child is a citizen of the nation. You know what? I'm, I'm Cherokee. I'm 
also a US citizen, but my birth father was Iraqi. So I'm a citizen of, or could be a citizen of three countries or, or nations. Um, so again, citizenship is something that has to be understood in context of um, ICWA. I'm trying to just go off the top of my head of any, any other key things and understanding where these children fit within their own tribal communities, what rights they have, what um, family dynamics they have, you know, again, my birth mother was not a great placement. I should not have been there, but my family was appropriate. And that extended family, which is a great thing that we're seeing more and more um, being considered in first line for the children. Um, that's something that has been litigated since early, early on as a grandmother. I mean, I, I did a case last year about a grandmother who had, you know, other children, the siblings of one child, one child, and the state wouldn't release that child. And so we had to get that child back with that grandmother. A again, um, first in line placement preferences. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of summarizing a lot in there. I feel like, um, are there questions? Because I could wax. I think more. you're doing good. I'm I'm monitoring the chat questions and everything. Everybody's just enthralled. So keep it up. <laughs> well, I'm just I, I my brain goes a, a bunch of directions when I start in when I really get in. Um, I think that um, I'm trying to think of other key points. I would love for tribes, and I, I kind of touched on this lightly. I would love for tribes if you are looking, or even a parent attorney uh, um, or an Indian custodian attorney, if you're Indian child is not being recognized or recognized or adequate, adequately represented, I would absolutely file. And I, you know, I've done this a few times. I would file for that child to have a attorney that is qualified within the tribal community um, or, you know, able to represent whether it's under ICWA or, you know, ICWA, or if it's a lay person, sometimes somebody that can step into that court and again, it is an option that the, the court can look at, but I would love for tribes to start initiating, especially when these are children's attorneys are not always versed for the Indian child to step in and say, hey, we have an attorney. We want this attorney appointed for our child because this is our child and we want the child defended and do that early. Um, some tribes do that, some don't. Um, there are tribes in the country that are beginning the process of certifying ICWA guardian ad litems or CASAs. Uh, so that might also be another option is that you get volunteers from your community. Uh, they can be tribal, they can be non-tribal. As long as they have a heart that's willing to listen and learn and advocate for that child. So I think what Angel is saying is that you don't have to be a lawyer to make a difference. Yes. And, and I, I just think the important part is, is understanding or seeking to understand um, the child's own tribal structure, what's available from a government side, what's available from a community side, what's available from the family side. Um, you know, I will be honest, I've even had to challenge a few um, GALs sometimes because, you know, if you say a child's eyes didn't wax bright at a visitation, I'm like, yeah, but that's not, that's not cultural. You know, that's, let's say maybe the kid was having a bad day. I mean, you can't, you have to be understanding the concept of, of what's going on within that community and what those things mean. Cause some things that are um, specific to one tribe or community or culture may not be for another. So the openness, and I really like that judge recommended that and thought about that. Um, you don't have to be native, but you do need to be open and listening.